Hello, and welcome to another edition of Orthopedic Sports Medicine Patient Educational Series with Dr. Adam Draghi. In this video, we're going to explore the different aspects of superior capsular reconstruction, or an SCR. Specifically, we're going to look at what the difference is between patients that require an SCR versus a traditional rotator cuff repair. We'll also go over the specifics of the surgical procedure required to perform an SCR, as well as some of the differences that patients can expect in the rehab following an SCR versus a traditional rotator cuff repair. Patients with chronic, massive, full thickness rotator cuff tears with significant amount of tendon retraction and atrophy or shrinking of their muscles previously had very little options in terms of how to treat such a condition. Oftentimes those types of rotator cuff tears are not amendable to a repair simply because the tendons won't pull all the way back over to the bone. Even if you were able to pull the tendons all the way to the bone, usually the muscles have shrunk down so severely and have been infiltrated with fat that they simply do not work. Also, they have an exceedingly high rate of re-tear following rotator cuff repairs of these massive tears. Previously, patients that had massive irreparable rotator cuff tears really did not have any really good minimally invasive arthroscopic solutions to their problem. In years past, your choices when faced with a massive irreparable rotator cuff tear were to either live with the symptoms the way they were, receiving multiple injections in the shoulder, or undergoing a shoulder replacement operation. Patients with a massive irreparable rotator cuff tear require a specific type of shoulder replacement called a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. Reverse meaning that the ball of the ball and socket gets moved over to the socket side and the socket of the ball and socket gets moved over to the ball side when you do the actual reconstruction. This is an outstanding operation for patients with massive irreparable rotator cuff tears. It does a lot to reduce significant pain and symptoms in the shoulder and increases the function of the shoulder. Because, however, you are not reattaching the rotator cuff tendon, patients can still have significant degrees of weakness following a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. The biggest concern with reverse total shoulder arthroplasty is in a small subset of patients in which they are simply too young to consider a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. Like other joint replacement surgeries such as knee and hip replacements, a shoulder arthroplasty has a certain shelf life before we can expect it to fail. Shoulder arthroplasties seem to be more prone to failure at an earlier time frame than knee or hip replacements. And because of this, as a general rule, I recommend to patients that they have a shoulder arthroplasty or a shoulder replacement done as late into life as possible. That way, when you do get your shoulder replaced, that shoulder replacement is going to last for the rest of your life, as opposed to you wearing the shoulder arthroplasty out early, requiring a revision operation. The historical problem with reverse total shoulder arthroplasty is in a small subset of patients that have massive irreparable rotator cuff tears but are still relatively young. This age group in general refers to any patients under the age of 60, especially patients that are still involved in heavy labor activities. Because most patients that have massive full thickness irreparable rotator cuff tears in their 50s are my laborers or farmers or construction workers, these patients are particularly interested in being able to return to work without any restrictions. The other big drawback of a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty is that because of the fragility of the prosthesis, most surgeons that perform shoulder replacements would recommend that patients have a 25 pound lifetime restriction 
on lifting with that arm so as not to wear out the prosthesis prematurely. For a lot of patients, this is an unacceptable situation and they are looking for alternative treatments for their massive, irreparable rotator cuff tears. It has only been relatively recently that arthroscopic reconstructive options have been available to this small subset of patients. Now let's take a closer look at the anatomy of the shoulder. Specifically, what happens to the anatomy of the shoulder when patients have a massive, irreparable rotator cuff tear? It is these changes that take place within the shoulder that led to the development of the superior capsular reconstruction procedure. Okay, so let's look at the anatomy of the shoulder and how that anatomy is changed as a result of a massive, irreparable rotator cuff tear. So here we have a right shoulder. This is the arm. This is the shoulder blade. Here is the collarbone up in the front of your body. Attached around the shoulder blade are a series of muscles whose tendons attach around the circumference of the ball of the ball and socket. And collectively, these tendons help you to rotate the shoulder. So we call it the rotator cuff. In patients that have a massive, full thickness, irreparable rotator cuff tear, there's no tendons attached on top of the ball at all. And so instead of seeing a ball covered by tendons, we see a ball with no tendons above it. And the rotator cuff provides an essential function for the ball and socket, and that is that the tendons of the rotator cuff help to hold the ball down. Without the tendons holding the ball down, the ball rides up high and it starts to grind on the undersurface of the roof of the shoulder. Because it's not being held down, it also does not articulate with the center of the socket, but rather rides up high on the socket. And when the ball rides up high, we call this process humeral head elevation. And as the ball rides up high, it is not articulating in an appropriate position. And so over time, the ball and socket starts to develop arthritis of the ball and socket. This is a specific type of arthritis called rotator cuff arthropathy. The concept of a superior capsule reconstruction is to try to reestablish the appropriate relationship of the ball to the socket by connecting a piece of soft tissue from the top of the ball over to the top of the socket that can hold the ball or keep the ball down so that it does not ride up high and articulate abnormally. You will see more about the specifics of the surgery for superior capsule reconstructions in my surgical animation video. A superior capsule reconstruction or an SCR seeks to restore the relationship of the ball to the socket so that it is not riding up too high. The way that we do that is by reattaching the top of the ball to the top of the socket with a donor skin graft. Most people think of skin grafts as being a very thin piece of skin that's placed over wounds such as burn wounds. In this instance, we're using a full thickness skin graft, meaning the graft is three to four millimeters thick. This is a very thick, stout, robust graft that is used to keep the ball down and to keep the ball from riding up too high. The advantages of a superior capsule reconstruction is that this can be placed arthroscopically through poke holes in the skin. It is done as an outpatient procedure and it maintains the native anatomy of the joint. Oftentimes we are going into the shoulder arthroscopically to evaluate the condition of the rotator cuff tendon first. It is always preferable to try and do a primary rotator cuff repair first. As all patients are better off to have their native rotator cuff hooked to the top of the ball as opposed to the skin graft. Intraoperatively then, we will make a decision as to whether or not the rotator cuff is able to be fixed or not. If at the time of the surgery it is determined that the rotator cuff simply cannot be fixed, 
then we elect to make the conversion intraoperatively to the placement of a superior capsule reconstruction. Therefore, I tell patients that we're on the fence as to whether or not we'll be able to fix the tendon or not, that they have to be hopeful that we can fix the rotator cuff, but they have to be mentally prepared for the possibility of receiving a superior capsular reconstruction graft. On the day of surgery, very little changes whether we do a rotator cuff repair or a superior capsular reconstruction. The procedure is still done arthroscopically. It is still an outpatient procedure. You still go home the same day. However, the post-operative rehabilitation following a superior capsule reconstruction is considerably different from that of a traditional rotator cuff repair rehabilitation program. And the reason for the differences is primarily because with a superior capsule reconstruction, we're trying to get the body to grow into a foreign material or a graft. And so the incorporation time and the healing time takes longer with a superior capsule reconstruction as opposed to a primary rotator cuff repair. This is especially noticeable in the first few months after the procedure and how we protect the arm. For greater details in the post-operative rehabilitation following a superior capsule reconstruction, I recommend that you see my video on superior capsule reconstruction post-operative rehabilitation. I also recommend that you view my video on the use of the post-operative sling following a superior capsule reconstruction. I hope this video has helped you to better understand exactly what is a superior capsule reconstruction and when we would choose to use a superior capsule reconstruction as opposed to doing a primary rotator cuff repair. Massive irreparable rotator cuff tears have always presented patients with very difficult clinical situations. With the advent of superior capsule reconstructions, we now have more options for these patients. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please contact my office with any further questions that you might have regarding superior capsule reconstructions. Have a great day.